Hello everybody, thank you for clicking on my video. Uh, if you saw in the last video, I was quite sick, I didn't feel well. I am feeling a lot better now, and I think I'll be able to produce a lot more content in the coming future. So, let's get into it. Is there revolutionary potential in the United States? Or, for that matter, is there revolutionary potential in the first world? Many self-proclaimed third worldists will tell you no, there is not. I, as an ex-third worldist, am here to tell you that this is a false conception. What is third worldism? Third worldism is the theory which states that the revolution is either only possible or far more likely to occur in countries of the third world. Third world being that of Mao's definition being the countries which are imperialized. So why is this false? To put it simply, they misjudge where the primary contradictions of capitalism lie. If we are to go off the third worldist narrative, then we must assume that the primary contradictions of capitalism are the contradictions between imperialist and imperialized countries. However, we know that this statement is false. Objectively, the primary contradiction of capitalism is the contradiction between the class interest of the employer and the employee, the contradiction of exploitation. How can we conclude that exploitation is the primary contradiction of capitalism? There are two ways. Capitalism, and for that matter, socialism, has existed before this imperialist stage. Capitalism, as Lenin notes, was not and is not always imperialist. Imperialism is, instead, the highest stage of capitalism. This higher stage only forms after the progressive period of capitalism ceases, where capital has concentrated into monopoly capital, where it has exhausted domestic market potential, and must then spread to other countries looking for new markets to export to. Not all countries make it to this point. As a matter of fact, very few have. So we know that capitalism, at its inception, cannot be seen as inherently imperialist, only that it becomes that way. But we also know that Marx and Engels developed their theory of scientific socialism well before the imperialist stage of capitalism. This means that there must be a third thing, something which has not been referred to yet. 2. The dialectical interpretation of what Marx asserted in mode of production is human relation to the productive forces of society and the relations of production. Within capitalism, the defining feature is the private ownership of capital and the employment of certain people from the reserve army of labor. What then would Marx as the primary economic motivator of capitalism? It would stand to reason that the answer to this question is profit. The profit motive is the primary economic motivator of capitalism. And we can test this. If a business owner does not make profits from the sales of their produce, the business will stagnate or fail. The seeking of profits is indeed what leads to exploitation and eventually monopoly and imperialist capitalism. The exploitation of the laborer must occur in order for profits to be realized. The employee must make less than the employer. After all, the employer has to take care of things. They have to take inventory and spend money on restocking inventory. But exploitation creates inherent class interests, which lead to, as you guessed it, internal contradictions. This would make exploitation the foremost and most basic contradiction within capitalism, upon which all other contradictions rely upon the existence of. Exploitation is the primary contradiction of capitalism. Stating this, so long as there is employer and employee, so long as class exists, there is class struggle. So long as class exists, there is revolutionary potential. So why do third worldists perpetuate a false narrative? Well, it's not exactly their fault. When you look through history, the great socialist revolutions came from poor, backwards regions. Russia, China, South America, and alike. Without a greater expounding upon the causes of these revolutions, it may seem correct to conclude that revolutions only happen in poor places. But like stated, this is without greater expounding upon of information. In Foundations of Leninism by J.V. Stalin, it is explained to us exactly why these revolutions happened in poor regions. Quote, the same thing approximately happened in the case of Russia and Lenin as in the case of Germany and Marx and Engels in the 40s of the last century. Germany at the time was pregnant with the bourgeois revolution, just like Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. Marx wrote that at time in the manifesto, the communists should turn their attention chiefly to Germany. 
because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under the most advanced conditions of European civilization, and that a much more developed proletariat than that of England was in the 17th and France in the 18th century. And because the bourgeois revolution in Germany will be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. In other words, the center of the revolutionary movement was shifting to Germany. There can hardly be any doubt that this very circumstance, noted by Marx in the above quote passage, that served as the probable reason why it was precisely Germany that became the birthplace of scientific socialism, and why the leaders of the German proletariat, Marx and Engels, became its creators. The same, only to a still greater degree, must be said of Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. Russia was then on the eve of bourgeois revolution. She had accomplished this revolution at a time when conditions in Europe were more advanced, and with a proletariat that was more developed than that of Germany in the 40s of the 19th century, let alone Britain and France. Moreover, all the evidence went to show that this revolution was bound to serve as a ferment and as a prelude to the proletarian revolution. We cannot regard it as accidental that as early as 1902, when the Russian Revolution was still in an embryonic state, Lenin wrote the prophetic words in his pamphlet, What is to be done? History has now confronted us with an immediate task, which is the most revolutionary of all the immediate tasks that confront the proletariat of any country, and that the fulfillment of this task, the destruction of the most powerful bulwark, not only of European, but also, it may be noted now, of Asiatic reaction, would make the Russian proletariat the vanguard of the international revolutionary proletariat. In other words, the center of the revolutionary movement was bound to shift to Russia. End quote. So from this we are able to take that it was not chiefly because these countries were poor that they had their revolutions, but because the revolutionary movement shifted to them before their respective revolutions. Now, this does not mean that revolution must be only and primarily based around whether or not that country is going through a bourgeois revolution or not. If that were the case, the idea of socialism would be all but dead. However, this does conclude that the previous revolutions of the 20th century and the developments made to scientific socialism were made chiefly due to the birth of capitalism within Russia and China. Third worldists also cite the lack of an industrial proletariat within the first world, as a way of cementing the idea within themselves that revolution in their countries is impossible. This can only be the conclusion drawn from dogmatists. If we are to assert that any sect of the proletariat should lead the revolution, we must first examine what that sect of the proletariat's relation to capitalism is. Marx, Engels, and Lenin all cited the industrial proletariat as the revolutionary sect of the proletariat. This much is true. But I would ask, does the industrial proletariat possess some form of magical essence which makes it the revolutionary sect? No, of course not. Such things do not exist within science. So then, why did Marx and Engels specifically name the industrial worker as the inheritor of the revolution? It is because, at the time of Marx and Engels, Lenin too, the capitalists were the industrialists, and so, the most profitable, and thereby most exploited, sect of the proletariat would be the factory worker. They are correct in saying the first world has little or no industrial proletariat, as we have mostly shipped them to third world countries. However, the revolution does not simply get shipped with them, as there is no magical essence that makes the industrial proletariat more revolutionary than other sects. If we are to understand what sect of the proletariat is to be deemed the most revolutionary, then we must look to the domineering industry in each respective country. It is undoubtedly that the first world is experiencing the rise of a new sect of the proletariat, the new most profitable worker, that being the service industry worker. The service industry is all that's left, and so their employees stand to be the most profitable and most exploited. So does the United States and the rest of the first world have revolutionary potential? Yes, just as all countries do. However, the revolutionary nature of the factory worker has been passed down to the service industry worker.